everybody, it's Mr. Matthew here for another biology video, this time talking about changes in signal transduction pathways. So this video is going to be really important, particularly for large AP style open response questions, because these types of questions are actually really a heavy cornerstone to you being able to understand how a system is made up of different parts and those parts interact. And if you perturb or change one of the components of the system, then how does that end up impacting the system? And so it's very common to use changes in signal transduction pathways in AP questions. Uh, so uh, I'm going to get to it. So first up, we're going to start with to explain how a change in a structure of any signaling molecule affects the activity of the signaling pathway. So I'm going to start by just doing a quick review of our signal transduction pathway. So again, remember, a signal transduction pathway has three components. We have reception, and that is where a ligand or some sort of molecule, usually we say a ligand, binds to a receptor. And then after that reception, there is a signal transduction. That means that there is a series of reactions producing secondary messengers. Those secondary messengers are going to be propagated within the cells. And then ultimately, this leads to a response within the cell. Uh, and that's going to be some sort of cellular activity that happens there. So we always see these three different components. What this means is we've got a lot of different places where things can be changed. Uh, first of all, the molecule itself uh, that hormone, if a hormone is something like a peptide hormone, which would be described here, that means it's a peptide, a, a series of amino acids. So if that was produced through transcription and translation, there could be a different structure to that hormone. If there's a different structure to the signal, then it's not going to bind to the receptor maybe at all, or maybe not in the same way. Similarly, the receptors are typically proteins, and so those could be modified. Um, and so if the receptor particularly has a mutation in the binding domain, then the hormone or the peptide would not be able to bind to that. And then again, it could actually have a mutation in um, the signaling end of that reception. So even though there's a binding, it may not propagate and start that secondary messenger, and it may not kick off the signal transduction pathway. The signal transduction pathway will have several, usually enzymes that will be modifying compounds throughout the process. So if any of one of any of those become changed, that's going to change the signal. And then lastly, the response. Oftentimes, the response is a target of something in the cell. And so again, if there's some sort of receiving of a signal or modification that happens, then the response may not occur. So as you can see that you can change a lot of these different components. So it's really important, again, looking at these that we have lots of potential points of mutations. It is important to note that uh, we have really two broad pathways we often talk, talk about, which are non-genomic pathways and genomic pathways. And so, again, mutations um, in any domain of the receptor protein or any component in these signal transduction pathways downstream of these components will alter the signal transduction. If, for example, there is a mutation in the DNA itself in a genomic pathway, yeah, the signal bound to a receptor, and then that starts a signal transduction pathway that leads to a, the DNA being uh, transcribed. Well, if the transcription leads to a different protein, then we have a different pathway that happens there. And then, as I mentioned before, we have all sorts of uh, proteins. You change any of these proteins, particularly in an appropriate binding domain um, or in a active area where it would be an active site to uh, propagate that signal and you're going to have an altered cellular response. So just a quick little notation about uh, about how you will often see these pathways demonstrated. So a lot of times what we see in our uh, signals is substance A or compound A um, activates compound B, which then activates compound C. But it is also possible that uh, certain compounds will block the formation of the next compound. And so when we look at this LMN pathway, what we see is that substance L actually inhibits or blocks the activity of substance M. So that means when substance M is present and L is not, M will lead to the production of N. But if substance L is present, it's going to block M from doing its work. It could be doing this by uh, binding and inhibiting its activity. It could alter it and modify it and inactivate it in some way. But L 
and M both being present means that the pathway is going to be stopped. And that's what that um, upside down T looks like where L blocks the M. And then we also could have a case where Q is going to produce uh, compound R and then R acts as an inhibition to the ultimate process. So again, you see one of these upside down T's and that's going to mean an inhibitory signal. You see an arrow, those tend to mean activation signals. Now, so this is really where we get into the uh, trickiness of sort of some of the AP questions. We look at that first pathway, that ABC pathway. Very simple. We look at it and we say, all right, now there's a mutation in the formation of compound B. And so B represents a particular protein and under non-mutation standpoints, A leads to B that leads to C. There's a mutation in B. And so now A produces B, but then B doesn't have its normal function. And so therefore we don't ultimately get C. That's, that's a pretty straightforward pathway. But what happens if we end up having a mutation in the second pathway? And so, what we have is we have a mutation in compound M. Well, now if M isn't going to function and M, which normally is going to lead to the production of N, whether or not we have that substance L present, if M has been mutated and is not functioning, it really doesn't matter if we have compound L present or not. Yeah, L normally blocks M from working, but if the mutation led to M being non-functioning, M's not going to lead to N. And so now you get into the case where if you really understand the pathway, you will understand that the mutation of M actually makes compound L irrelevant to this process. And then similarly, let's say we have the pathway that is the QRS pathway and that Q leads to production of R and R normally blocks S. Let's say again, we mutate R. And so now normally Q activates R and then when R is present, it blocks S. But now if we have a mutation to the protein R, now, again, it really doesn't matter if we have Q or R present, we're not going to be able to inhibit S. So if compound S is produced by some other pathway, and normally the pres presence of Q produces compound R and then R blocks S so that it may be part of a feedback mechanism, that, that sort of thing. Now what happens is that if there's a mutation of R, we've lost sort of the breaks to the system that produces S and S is going to be produced, assuming that the other pathway that produces S is functioning normally. So you get a little bit of clarification. These arrows versus these uh, upside down T's or block signals are really important in here. So now let's look at a specific example of this. And so what I have here is a chemical pathway that interferes with any component of the signaling pathway it may activate or inhibit the pathway. And so I showed you this in the pre previous example. And so what I have is a really complicated apoptosis signal. And I'm, I'm going to highlight some specific things. But again, typically in an AP question, you're going to have a lot of information thrown at you. You're going to have to do some filtering to figure out what's important, what's not. And so let me give you a little bit of background and then we're going to do a quick pause and think. So let's start with this. We're going to focus in on caspase 3. And so the casp3 gene encodes for a protease, which we're calling a, ca uh, a caspase. And caspases play a key role in apoptosis. This is also known as program cell death. Capsases are typically um, in an inactive form, and they may be activated by various apoptotic signals, including from other capsases. There's also X-linked inhibitors of apoptosis protein, which is called XIAP, and that is a protein that inhibits caspase 3, therefore stopping cell death. All right, so hopefully you got that. We have normally caspases, which are involved in leading to apoptosis. We have this XIAP that's a protein that inhibits caspases. All right, so here's the pause and think moment. And I've hopefully highlighted, even though there's a lot of extra information in here, I've given you just enough to think about that you will hopefully think about this. So apoptosis is an important cell process that actually prevents the formation of cancers. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that. Normally, if you have a cell and it receives a, an incorrect signal and it's having some things going wrong in its normal cell cycle, an apoptosis signal will take a cell that is not undergoing normal 
you know, cell cycling, and it will say, oh, this cell is not behaving correctly, and so let's let's cause it to um, undergo apoptosis. So apoptosis is an important cell process that actually prevents bad cells from propagating and forming cancers. So the question I have for you is, would a mutation to the XIAP gene increase or decrease the risk for cancer? And I want you to justify your answer. So take a moment and think of a mutation of that would increase or decrease your risk for cancer. Pause and think. All right. So this is a tricky one. Hopefully you thought about it. And what you realized is that what we see is the XIAP molecule normally blocks CASP3. So what that means is it normally blocks apoptosis. Well, if we want apoptosis to be working in order to prevent cancer cells, we actually, it's not really a big deal if the XIAP is mutated or not. Now, I'm not saying this is going to be good for you. You're, you don't want to necessarily always having all your cells undergo apoptosis. That's one of the reasons why we have regula regulators there. But this wouldn't necessarily lead to, on its own, an increase for cancer. It might lead to other issues. And in fact, this could be very easily associated with a disease where you have uh, like tissue death of healthy tissue that you want to stay healthy. So I'm not saying that a mutation to XIAP would be good for you. I'm just asking in this particular question, would it lead to cancer? And the answer is, if we're thinking about cancers are regulated by apoptosis, the answer would be no. Again, probably not good to have all your cells undergoing apoptosis. So I probably would vote against having this mutation um, in general. It's an important key regulator, but hopefully you got that for this specific instance, it wouldn't lead to cancer. Okay. All right. I know this is a really tricky example, but um, I wanted to highlight some of the ways that you could have a signal transduction pathway and what would happen if you were to have a mutation in part of that pathway. Uh, so I hope this was a little bit helpful and I will talk to everybody soon.